Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Uh, we've got a lot of folks still joining us, so we're going to give it until about two minutes after the hour, and then we'll go ahead and get started promptly at 3.02 Eastern. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to part one of our A2L Refrigerants webinar series. My name is Tom Deary, and I am the Director of Codes for the Air Conditioning, Heating, and Refrigeration Institute. AHRI is the trade association representing manufacturers of heating, ventilation, air conditioning, refrigeration, and water heating equipment within the global industry. AHRI represents more than 330 manufacturers of air conditioning, space heating, water heating, and commercial refrigeration equipment and components. Before we begin, I would like to share the following disclaimer. The opinions expressed in this presentation and on the following slides are solely those of the presenters and not necessarily those of the Air Conditioning, Heating and Refrigeration Institute. HRI does not guarantee the accuracy or reliability of any information provided herein. This presentation is for general informational purposes only and does not constitute legal or professional advice. Please confer with your own legal counsel. And I would also like to note that today's session is being recorded. The discussion topics that we will cover today include regulatory drivers for A2Ls, key enablers of A2Ls, A2L background and safety classes, A2L flammability parameters, A2L test examples, and we will wrap up with a Q&A session. You may submit questions anytime using the Q&A button. We will answer questions as time permits, but I'll also provide contact information at the conclusion of today's session, and I encourage you to reach out to me with any additional questions. I would like to take a moment to introduce today's speakers. We are pleased to welcome Allison Skid, the Director of Regulatory Affairs for Ream Manufacturing, and Steven Spletzer, the Global Technical Service Manager for the Comores Company. Allison and Steven, thank you so much for joining us today. And with that, I will hand it over to Allison. Thank you, Tom, and good afternoon, everyone. As Tom said, my name is Allison Skid, and I'm with Ream, a manufacturer of a full line of space heating and cooling, water heating, and commercial refrigeration equipment. We've been preparing for A2L refrigerants for several years, and I'm glad to share with you some of the regulatory background behind that. You may have heard about A2L refrigerants for some time, but wondered when are they actually going to arrive in the market? I like to describe broad market adoption of A2L refrigerants as requiring three things. One, a regulatory driver to require low global warming potential alter alternatives. Two, EPA SNAP approval, with SNAP being the clearinghouse for refrigerant replacements by application, and three, updated building codes, because in order to install appliances containing flammables in buildings, codes must be updated to allow it. So let's dive in to number one. The reduction of hydrofluorocarbons, or HFCs, is a global trend. 
A successful HFC phase down is expected to avoid up to half a degree Celsius of global warming by the year 2100. As the HFC phase down progresses rapidly around the world and in the US, the HVACR industry is transitioning to the next generation of refrigerant alternatives with lower global warming potential. A2L refrigerants are the next generation of candidates capable of achieving the necessary GWP re reductions. The American Innovation and Manufacturing Act was signed into law in 2020 and authorizes the EPA to structure a 15-year phase down of HFCs across a variety of applications. The AIM Act will drive production and consumption of HFCs to a mere 15% of historic baseline levels by 2036, with the steps down aligning with the Kigali Amendment to the Montreal Protocol. The AIM Act directs EPA to address HFCs in three main ways. The first is phasing down HFC production and consumption through an allowance allocation program. The second is facilitating transitions to next generation technologies for applications that use HFCs. And the third is issuing regulations for the purposes of maximizing reclamation and minimizing releases to HF of, of HFCs from equipment to the environment. So our main focus is going to be the second leg of the stool, the transition to substitutes through GWP limits for specific applications. The EPA rule for this is now final and starting as soon as January 1st of next year, GWP restrictions will take effect in new refrigeration, air conditioning, and heat pump equipment, among other uses. There are many details of the EPA technology transitions rule available on their rulemaking webpage, but here's a sampling of the application-specific prohibitions. You can see that for stationary air conditioning and heat pumps, for example, as well as chillers for comfort cooling and ice rinks, the prohibition on substances higher than 700 GWP is as early as 2025. The refrigerant alternatives below 700 GWP for air conditioning and heat pumps are primarily class A2L refrigerants. Here you can see even more of the EPA restrictions by application requiring as low as 150 and 300 GWP in refrigeration applications in 2026 and 2027, cold storage warehouses, supermarkets, and remote condensing units all going to very low GWP limits in the near term. So going back to our list, it's safe to say we absolutely have a regulatory driver for HFCs, so we can check that. And not just at the individual state level anymore, so now we'll take a look at the second requirement for broad market adoption of A2Ls. So SNAP is a program under the US EPA that stands for Significant New Alternatives Program. SNAP under, operates under the Clean Air Act, which requires EPA to evaluate substitutes for the ozone depleting substances to re reduce overall risk to human health and the environment. And through these evaluations, considering flammability, toxicity, environmental risks, the SNAP office generates lists of acceptable and unacceptable substitutes for each major sector. So where does this stand for our industry? There are three rules that are most relevant at the, at the present time. SNAP Rule 23 approved R32, an A2L refrigerant, for use in new air conditioning and heat pumps subject to use conditions. The next impactful rule was SNAP Rule 25, which listed several other A2L refrigerants that you can see on the screen for HVACR and revised some of the use conditions for R32. And then most recently, we have SNAP Rule 26, which has been proposed but is not yet final, and that will authorize many of the necessary substitutes for commercial refrigeration needed to meet those AIM GWP limits. The use conditions under the SNAP rules follow UL standards 60335-2-40 and 60335-2-89. It's important to remember that they authorize A2Ls for new equipment only, and include requirements such as warning labels. So now we've established that we're near the finish line for EPA SNAP rules. Next on our list is updated codes. 
I'm just going to quickly touch on standards and codes since more details on this will be included in future AHRI webinars. Much of the guidance for designing equipment to use A2Ls comes from our updated safety standards. There are important safety requirements for air conditioning and heat pumps in the third edition of UL standards 60335-2-40 and for refrigeration in the second edition of UL standards 60335-2-89. ASHRAE 15 and 15.2 have also been revised, and updates focus on mitigation and safety measures designed to prevent reaching flammable concentration in air and ultimately an ignition event. Now that the standards have been updated, they can be referenced in the model and local codes, which have been completed to a large extent. The updated model codes need to be adopted by the states on an individual basis, and there's been a tremendous amount of progress on this as we prepare for 2025. AHRI has created an online interactive map, so you can actually click on a state and find out the status of A2L readiness. If you've not already seen this map, stay tuned today for more information on where to find it. More details on this and a lot more will be covered in the rest of our session as well as the next two webinars. So now let's spend some time on A2L fundamentals. And for that, I'll turn it over to Stephen. Thank you, Allison. It's a lot of great information there. And I just wanna spend some time now going over some of the background that led to the development and the deployment of A2L refrigerants as the primary replacements for HFCs. Now, if you think about the regulations that Allison just discussed and the lower GWP levels that are going to be required, when the industry started looking for lower GWP alternatives to meet those requirements, what they found was that for many applications, there were no good alternatives. So this became a major challenge for the industry, how to safely transition our industry to the use of flammable refrigerants. And that's where A2Ls become critical. So one of the fundamental building blocks though of many A2L refrigerants is HFO technology. Now HFOs or hydrofluoroolefins are very similar in their chemical structure to the HFC refrigerants that they're replacing. But one major fundamental difference is that the HFOs have an unsaturated double bond. And what's the impact of this? Well, inside of a system, there's not a lot of impact because the refrigerant mains, remains stable in your air conditioning or refrigeration equipment. But when you release that refrigerant to the atmosphere, when it's exposed to the sun, for example, that double bond is relatively weak and breaks down much more easily leading to much shorter atmospheric lifetimes for these molecules and therefore much lower global warming potentials or GWPs. And to give you an example for some perspective on this, R134A was the primary refrigerant for mobile air conditioning. It had a GWP of 1430 and it's being replaced in large part by R1234YF and HFO in mobile air conditioning applications. And the GWP of R1234YF, which is very similar in its properties and performance to 134A, is only four. So you're talking over a 99% reduction in GWP, which is great, and that helps enable us to meet those goals. But R1234YF is an A2L and therefore does have lower flammability. So with that in mind, let's talk about the different refrigerant flammability classes as assigned by ASHRAE standard 34. Starting at the bottom, we have the least flammable refrigerants, class one, no flame propagation. And historically, most of the refrigerants that we're used to working with were A1 refrigerants, products like R410A or 134A, or your HFO blends like R449A or R513A. Now, however, we're seeing class 2L or A2L refrigerants become the primary replacements for HFCs, and these have lower flammability 2L classification, products like R1234YF and R454B. You go a little further up the flammability spectrum, you reach class 2 flammable. There aren't a lot of refrigerants in use with this flammability classification, 
One that's notable is R152A, but it's primarily used as a propellant and not as a refrigerant unless it's used as a component in refrigerant blends. And then at the far end of the flammability spectrum, you have the higher flammability class three products like hydrocarbons, such as propane and isobutane. Now the industry has spent over the last decade trying to help safely enable the broader use of A2L and A3 refrigerants in new applications. Transitioning from the smaller charge applications they were historically used in, like domestic refrigerators or window units, into larger charge, larger types of systems. So as we're moving to these new system designs with flammable refrigerants, it's important to understand how those differences in flammability are impacting system design. Now, A2Ls were really designed to do two things. They were designed to mirror the performance of the HFCs as closely as possible while also minimizing the risk associated with flammability. And when you keep this in mind and you look at how A1s and A2Ls compare, what you see is they have a tremendous amount of similarities. First and foremost, they have similar temperature pressure profiles, like the example I'm showing here on the right, where we're comparing the PT relationship of r 4 a and R454B. But they also have similar thermodynamic properties in terms of close capacities and efficiencies, similar material compatibility. They generally use the same oil types and have similar compatibility characteristics and often use similar system architectures. This is great for the industry because it helps minimize system redesign and because we're going to be seeing systems with the new refrigerants that are very familiar and very similar to the types of equipment we've been used to working with. So where are the key differences? Well, that comes back to the flammability. Now, a lot of people think that A1 refrigerants are non-flammable, but that's technically not accurate. Class one means no flame propagation, and that's when you're testing at the conditions in the ASHRAE 34 standard. But the fact is, A1 refrigerants like r 4 a and R134A can combust and burn when exposed to a flame, extremely hot surfaces, or at elevated temperatures and pressures. Now, A2L refrigerants, on the other hand, do exhibit lower flammability, which means they will propagate a flame at the conditions prescribed in ASHRAE standard 34. However, they may do so weekly. Now, again, I just wanna highlight here, if we look at the quick comparison of the properties of A1s and A2Ls. In this example, again, I'm using r 4 a and R454B, which looks to be the dominant replacement for r 4 a for North America in air conditioning applications. And when we look, we see that 454B is slightly lower in capacity slightly higher in efficiency, has slightly lower operating pressures, and slightly higher discharge temperatures. But at the end of the day, there's not a tremendous amount of difference here in terms of how these refrigerants perform overall. So that's the performance side. So let's get back to looking at flammability because there are significant differences between the flammability characteristics of A1s and A2Ls versus say A3 refrigerants or higher flammability products. And in order to appreciate those differences, we need to discuss the primary flammability parameters. And the first of those is the flammability limits, the lower flammability limit or LFL and the upper flammability limit or UFL. These are the minimum and maximum concentrations of refrigerant and air that will support an ignition, support propagation of a flame. If you're below the LFL, you don't have enough fuel for the ignition. If you're above the UFL, you're too rich in fuel and you don't have enough air. So in order to have a flammable concentration present, you need to be between the LFL and the UFL of the refrigerant and air. Then if you do have a flammable concentration, you need to be concerned about sources of ignition. And that's where your minimum ignition energy or MIE comes into play. MIE is the minimum amount of electrical energy required to ignite a flammable refrigerant in air. If your electrical energy sources are below the minimum ignition energy levels, 
Simply put, they're not a source of ignition for the refrigerant in question. And if you do get an ignition, then you want to be concerned about burning velocity and heat of combustion. Burning velocity describes how quickly a flame will propagate for a given composition, temperature, and pressure. The faster it propagates, you tend to have more severe ignition events with higher rates of pressure rise. And heat of combustion describes how much heat is given off when the refrigerant burns. So now let's take a look at a comparison of these flammability parameters. And here we're looking at two A2Ls, R32 and R1234YF, versus an A3, R290, or in this case, refrigerant grade propane. And when we look at the flammability parameters, it's important to consider the risk trends associated with these parameters. So when we start with the LFL or lower flammability limit, we see for propane, it's 38 grams per meter cubed. You really don't need to have a large leak of an A3 refrigerant to produce a flammable concentration. For the A2Ls, on the other hand, LFLs are typically on the order of 8 to 12 times higher. And what that means is that from a risk perspective, as LFL goes up, risk tends to go down because you need to leak out more refrigerant or leak out refrigerant at a faster pace to form a flammable concentration in the first place. But if you do get a flammable concentration, then again, we're concerned about sources of ignition and that's where minimum ignition energy or MIE comes into play. And for A3 refrigerants like propane, they can be ignited by relatively low energy sources like static electricity. And that's because the minimum ignition energy is very low at a quarter of a millijoule but the MIEs of the A2Ls are orders of magnitude higher. And that again plays into risk because as your MIEs go up, your risk tends to go down. As simply put, there are fewer things out there that can serve as a competent ignition source for A2L refrigerants. And then once you do get an ignition, you wanna look at the severity of the ignition by looking at burning velocity and heat of combustion. And for the A2Ls, these values are much lower than that of R290 or propane. The burning velocity of propane is 46 centimeters per second. It can propagate very quickly and easily once it gets ignited. But for the A2Ls, you're down to values less than 10 centimeters a second, which you can walk faster than that. And then likewise, the heats of combustion of an A3 are much higher than those of an A2L. So again, lower burning velocities, lower heats of combustion contribute to lower risk. When you put all these factors together, the more favorable flammability parameters of A2Ls can help minimize the risk associated with moving to a flammable refrigerant. Now that's all the numbers, but it's nice to have visuals to actually see the differences in flammability. So we did some testing to demonstrate this. And in the first example we're showing here, it's the ASTM E681 test. And this is actually the test used by ASHRAE standard 34 to determine the flammability limits. And basically you load a glass globe with a concentration of refrigerant, and then you try to ignite it with a high energy electrical ignition source. And when you get an ignition, if you see flame spread greater than 90 degrees, that typically indicates flammability or the ability to propagate a flame. So in the first example here, we're showing a class one refrigerant where the flame spread is just shy of 90 degrees. And then in our second example, we're showing a 2L refrigerant where the flame spread is just over 90 degrees. Now, on the surface, this doesn't look very different, but that 90 degree angle is a pretty good indicator as to whether or not you'll be able to propagate a flame. So it's an important distinction. And truth in reporting here, at different concentrations or with different refrigerants, you might see more flame spread with a 2L and less flame spread with a class one. But the reality is both of these groups of products are a world apart from the behavior you see with a class three refrigerant, where you get very rapid flame propagation that fills the globe and has to rapidly relieve the buildup of pressure from the vessel. So again, you see from this behavior, the 2L products behave much more closely to a class one product than they do a class three.
Another test we do is a ASTM D3065, which uh, measures the hazards of aerosol products. Um, one of the techniques they use is a flame projection test. And basically in this test, we're inverting a cylinder of refrigerant. So we spray out a liquid rich region and we're spraying it across an open flame source, in this case, a candle to see what happens. So here's the starting shot where we have R32, the A12 on top and propane, uh, the A3 on the bottom. And what we found when we do this test, and they did this with several A2Ls is that every time we extinguish the candle with the A2L refrigerant. And that's primarily because you're not forming a flammable concentration at the candle and the pressure uh, uh, that's used to propel the refrigerant forward actually ends up extinguishing the candle. However, in the test we did with propane, you could create a, essentially a blowtorch every time where you can start and stop that flame. And that's not surprising after all, because propane is a soldering gas. So it's not an unexpected difference. Another test example we did is looking at and measuring the minimum ignition energies of these products. And in this test, you, again, you're filling a glass globe with a concentration of refrigerant, and you're using a high energy electrical ignition source to attempt an ignition. And you keep increasing the energy level until an ignition is achieved. So starting at the bottom, it took very low energy, one millijoule, to ignite propane. And that's because the MIE of propane is just a quarter of a millijoule. And what we saw is rapid flame propagation that ejected the stopper violently from the flask and produced a flame volcano in the fume hood. Now, when we go to the upper right, you look at R32, we actually had to continue increasing the ignition energy till we reached 100 millijoules. There, we did get an ignition, but the flame spread was much slower. It did eventually fill the globe and eject the stopper, but it just popped lightly up to relieve the pressure. Now on the top left, we have R1234YF, and we went up to 1,000 millijoules and still couldn't produce an ignition. Fact is, you need a higher energy source than this test setup had to produce an ignition with R1234YF. Now, there's been a lot of research done in the industry to complement the testing that I showed you. Um, and I just want to show a couple examples in this presentation today. The first was an AHRI study, uh, report number 8017, that looked at potential sources of ignition in residential applications. And these are things that you might consider a classic uh, ignition source, for example, if you had a natural gas leak in the home. And what they found when they tested the A2Ls is that most things in the home would not produce an ignition. Things like space heaters, toasters, cordless drills, friction sparks, light switches, receptacles, cigarettes. None of these produced an ignition with the A2Ls in the testing done here. Now, there were a few things that did, typically open flames that you had from candles or a safety match or the, hot, uh, the surface of a hot wire. Those were able to produce an ignition with the A2Ls. Now, the last bit of testing that I want to show you here was a, a demonstration that we did comparing a uh, ignition event with uh, 1,200 grams of 454C and 500 grams of R290 in a refrigerated display case. Now, these charge levels were based on the charge limits currently allowed in the IEC 60335 2-89 standard for commercial refrigeration applications. And on the left, we have the ignition event that was produced with the A2L R454C. And on the right, we have the ignition event that was produced with the A3 R290. And even though you had significantly lower charge with the A3, the ignition event was much, much more severe. Now, in case you missed it, the red circle on the left is where the ignition event occurred with R454C. And that's a common result that we've seen in a lot of the testing done by the industry. We see small pencil-like flames that extinguish themselves when the igniter is turned off. Now, keep in mind, to be fair, this is a demonstration test. 
if the equipment is properly designed and installed per the safety standards, those safety standards are designed to prevent this type of behavior from occurring. So again, this is a demonstration project uh, test to show you what the difference in flammability looks like. So overall takeaways on flammability when we're comparing A2L and A3 refrigerants is one, A2Ls are less likely to form flammable concentrations by virtue of their higher flammability limits. And this fact allows us to use larger charge sizes and allow for the use of flammable refrigerants in larger types of equipment. Additionally, A2Ls are significantly harder to ignite by virtue of their higher minimum ignition energies. And this makes them safe to use with many commonly used electrical components. Keep in mind, there are things that will ignite A2Ls, very high energy electrical sources and open flames, for example, but many common electrical components can be used safely with A2 L refrigerants. And then A2 Ls are less reactive, have lower combustion energy by virtue of their burning velocity. This helps lead to lower severity ignition events. And information on these studies and more can be found by visiting our website. Now, going forward, keeping all this information in mind, how do we as an industry work with flammable refrigerants? Well, some important fundamentals to keep in mind is that first, flammable refrigerants should only be used in equipment specifically designed for them. You don't want to use A3s in a system designed for A2Ls or vice versa. It's not appropriate and it's not safe. And you want to make sure that your product designs and installations are in compliance with the relevant safety standards and building codes. There's been a lot of updates to the installation standards in this country, uh, ASHRAE 15 and ASHRAE 15.2 to help ensure safe installations. And you never want to use flammable refrigerants to retrofit non-flammable refrigerants. Okay, that's currently not approved and not allowed. Additionally, it's critical for installers and servicers to make sure you follow the installation and use instructions provided by the equipment manufacturers. There are some changes that are required to the equipment designs and the installations, and the OEM manuals are an excellent source of information to make sure you're keeping up with those requirements. Additionally, service techs want to make sure that their equipment that they're used to work on uh, A2L systems is suitable for the flammable refrigerant in question. Now, many of the tools service techs use today with A1 refrigerants will work with A2Ls. However, there are some key differences. Um, recovery machines, vacuum pumps, and leak detectors are equipment in specific that you want to pay attention to to make sure that your equipment is rated for the A2Ls. Uh, tool manufacturers have had A2L rated equipment out there for a while, so it's possible the equipment you're already using is, but check with the tool manufacturer to be sure. And then additionally, it's time to reinvigorate our commitment to best practices. Things like full recovery of the refrigerant from a system before we open it up to the atmosphere, um, deep evacuation before we put that system back in the service. Uh, using a nitrogen purge while brazing or soldering. These have always been best practices, but now with the move to flammable refrigerants, they are really a fundamental requirement. So re-embracing those best practices is key to a successful transition. Now, the standards have been updated and they've been updated several times because safety never stops and they are continuing to learn and improve the standards. Some of the key changes that you're gonna see as a result of the updates to the safety standards is first and foremost, these standards are focused on preventing an ignition in the first place. And keep in mind, what do you need to have an ignition? You need a flammable concentration present and you need a competent ignition source. So prevention is key here. So with that in mind, one of the things the standards do is eliminate sources of ignition 
from the equipment design and where possible from the installation area. Additionally, they have improved practices for piping to try and minimize the risk of refrigerant leakage occurring. They also have strict requirements on refrigerant charge limits and minimum room area, again, to minimize the risk of a concentration forming if a leak were to occur. And they also have, for many systems, onboard refrigerant detection that gets used to activate mitigation. And the mitigation usually takes the form of either air circulation, ventilation, or using safety shutoff valves to isolate the refrigerant charge. There's also additional requirements on labeling to help identify to the technician that there is a flammable refrigerant in the system. And there's also extensive new requirements for training and literature to help get everyone up to speed on the changes that are coming our way. Now, another thing that's good to be aware of is that flammable refrigerants typically are odorless. Unlike um, natural gas in the home or fuel grade propane, flammable refrigerants do not use stenching agents. And the reason for that is first and foremost, there are a number of corrosion and compatibility concerns with using those chemicals inside an air conditioning or refrigeration system that may damage the system and create other risks. Additionally, the stenching agents can be absorbed into the oil or the desiccant or become a non-condensable in the system that not only can negatively impact performance, can also defeat the purpose of having the stenching agent in the system in the first place. So how do we look for leaks on systems with flammable refrigerants? One, you use handheld sniffers and two, fixed detectors. That's what's commonly used. And like I mentioned before, many A2L systems will come with onboard leak detection. Soap bubbles, a tried and true method, can still be used with A2Ls because they work off of pressure, just like they did with an A1 refrigerant. However, you never ever want to use an open flame for leak detection with a refrigerant. It was never a good idea with an A1 refrigerant, and it's especially not a good idea with a flammable refrigerant. One last area of background that I want to cover today is fire safety. When uh, the fire service first learned of the move to flammable refrigerants in the air conditioning and refrigeration industry, they naturally had a lot of concerns. And that was despite the information that was shared with them regarding the lower flammability of A12 refrigerants and how they behave. So there was a collaborative joint effort between UL, the Fire Service Research Institute, AHRI, and the Fire Service to do testing and research that would serve as the basis for training. Training that is currently now available on the ulfirefightersafety.org website. And this is firefighter safety and flammable refrigerants. And this training is based on the AHRI 8028 research project that compared the behavior of A2Ls and A1 refrigerants in firefighting scenarios. And what this research indicated was that A2Ls were very difficult to ignite. And they also found very similar behaviors between the A1s and A12 refrigerants in firefighting scenarios. And they also, some of the recommendations in this project were basically to use the same types of PPE, whether you're dealing with A1 refrigerants or A12s, and there really weren't any significant changes uh, recommended to the tactics used by firefighters. So if you haven't, I widely encourage you to check out this training. And with that, I will turn it back over to you, Tom, for questions. Thank you, Stephen and Allison. This has been great. Um, we do have some time for questions and appreciate everyone who has already submitted questions. Uh, as I said, you may do so using the Q&A box and uh, also feel free to reach out to me afterwards uh, if you have additional questions. But uh, to begin, and I think, Allison, this is likely uh, a question for you. Uh, is it possible that the HFC regulations will be reversed if there is a change in administration? 
Thanks, Tom. Uh, no, I, I would say this is really not a likely outcome. The important thing to keep in mind is that the AIM Act was enacted in the previous administration, and, and it's a bipartisan agreement that set in motion technology advancement that has both climate and manufacturing benefits for the U.S. Um, that said, there are some legal challenges to the specifics of the EPA rule, um, and EPA will need to respond to those legal challenges. Um, but we would not expect something like the AMAX to get rolled back in a future administration. Thank you, Allison. Okay, uh, Stephen, I think this one is likely aimed towards you. Uh, do A2Ls contain propane or other hydrocarbons? Thanks, Tom. Uh, the short answer is no. And where I think some of this confusion comes from is that when you look at A2L refrigerant one of the components you commonly see is R1234YF, and in the name you see tetrafluoropropene. And some people are associating that with propane, which is not the case. The fluorine completely changes the behavior of the refrigerants. There, there are no hydrocarbons in the A12 refrigerants. Thank you. Uh, moving on here, will the leak detector alarm audibly or visibly? I can answer that one, Tom. Um, no, this, the safety standards require mitigation actions to be taken, and as Stephen described, but it, they do not require alarms um, like to the consumer, for example. Thank you. Um, we have a question here. Will I still be able to braise? Um, I'll take that one, Tom. Uh, Brazing is allowed. It is an acceptable method for forming joints with A2L refrigerants. So yes, you will be able to braze. Okay, thank you. Uh, more about leak detection. Will the leak detection system come from the factory or is it purchased separately? Yeah, Tom, I've, I've heard this question asked in several forums. Um, and so it really depends on the manufacturer and the model of equipment. Um, some models will come with the sensors included while others will be sold separately and will have instructions for field installation. So you're definitely going to see a mix of those in the market. Thank you, Allison. Uh, is there a chance we will be moving to solderless connections with the new refrigerants? So I can answer that one. So mechanical fittings are allowed with the A12 refrigerants. There was actually a, an ASHRAE research project, I believe it was RP1808, that looked at the use of mechanical fittings with A2Ls and found that they are acceptable. So you will see things like uh, press connect fittings, for example, being used with the A2Ls. Thank you, Stephen. Um, question about A2, uh, uh, certifications that are specific to A2L and, and where those could be obtained. Um, I'll jump on that one. So there are a number of certifications, uh, available from industry and I'm not, don't want to advertise anyone, but just to name a few, I think, uh, the ESCO Institute has one. ACA has one. I believe Nate has one as well. Those are A2L certifications, I believe. But there's also a wide variety of A2L training that might not be called a certification, but a wide variety of A2L training available from refrigerant manufacturers, equipment manufacturers, and others. So the training is out there. Uh, thank you, Stephen. Um, we mentioned... Uh, you know, cautioning against retrofitting, but the question about, is there anything, is there any way to modify, for example, a 410A unit to 454B or going backwards from 454B to 410A as was done in the transition from R22 to 410A? 
So Allison, do you want to take that one or do you want me to jump on it? Yeah, sure. And feel free to add to this, um, Stephen, but the simple answer is no. Um, the, the standards do not provide a path for that type of modification. Um, and, and the certification is based on, you know, the class of equipment, the, the class, the safety class that that piece of equipment was designed for. So there is no path in the standards for that type of modification. I'll just add that the EPA SNAP 23 ruling, when it approved six A12 refrigerants for use in residential and light commercial air conditioning, specifically stated that it was for new systems only and they were not allowed to be used for retrofits. So that's some additional information to consider. Thank you. Um, I know we haven't gotten to every question. I'll, I'll, I will encourage you to reach out to me afterwards and I'll have my contact information uh, shortly. Uh, there are a number of questions that we, we are receiving that are all kind of fit within the, uh, under the umbrella of where can I go? Where can contractors go? Where can people go to, to find more resources on A2O refrigerants? And that's a good segue uh, into, into my next couple slides here. So I do first of all want to mention our upcoming sessions. And I know in the chat, we have uh, information for registration for part two and part three. Uh, part two of this webinar series is going to focus on the updates to the standards and the model codes. So we're gonna specifically talk about the updates to UL 63 excuse me, UL 6335-2-40 and-2-89, as well as ASHRAE 15 and ASHRAE 15.2. We'll also look at all the changes that have been made to the model codes, um, the ICC codes, as well as uh, NFPA 1, the fire code, uh, NFPA 55. Uh, lots of different model codes have been changed uh, to address the use of A2O refrigerants. So a lot of information will be coming forward on that on Friday, May 31st, 1 p.m. Eastern. But that session will also be recorded, as will part three. So if you're unable to join us at that time, we will certainly make these, uh, these video sessions available to you as well. And then uh, we'll be wrapping up Wednesday, June 12th at 3 p.m. Eastern for uh, a look at the, the current status of state and local codes. Where have states and jurisdictions updated their codes to allow for A2L refrigerants? Where has that done? Where has that been done by legislation? Uh, where have there been letters of approval issued? All of that information will be provided during that session, and then we will really go in deep on all of the available resources out there. And those are available resources from AHRI, from ICC, and from other organizations. So we'll have lots of information coming about that. However. Also want to share this QR code with you. If you take a moment and scan that QR code, that is going to take us to uh, the resource that Allison mentioned, and that is our A2L refrigerant interactive map. And this is a map where you can click on a state and you can see if the building codes have been updated for uh, pertaining to air conditioning, to commercial refrigeration, to warehousing, um, or if they've not been updated yet, and legislation has been passed to allow the use of A2L refrigerants, there's a direct link to that legislation so you can see what it says uh, and how it applies. Or additionally, if a letter of approval has been granted by a jurisdictional authority, um, we have a link to that letter so you can read that as well. So it's a very helpful tool, um, and it also has a, a direct link uh, to me so if you have any questions, and I'll also share my information here, but please reach out. Uh, my name is Tom Deary. Again, I'm the director of codes for AHRI, and AHRI truly is invested in, in making sure that this is a smooth transition to these new refrigerants. Um, it, it's been a long process, but, but we are nearing the end here, and we are here to answer questions. So please email me at T-D-E-A-R-Y at ahrinet.org. My direct phone is provided there as well. And on the map page, 
uh, there is also a, a contact us button that goes directly to me. So always happy to answer any questions or to direct you to whomever the, the best person for your question is. But I do wanna say on behalf of both myself and AHRI, my sincere thanks to both Allison and Stephen for volunteering their time and expertise for today's session. Uh, again, if you have any questions about the material covered in today's webinar or about any other topics related to AHRI or to the A2L refrigerant transition, please don't hesitate to reach out to me directly. Thank you all so much for attending today's session. And I, I really look forward to seeing you all here again for May, on May 31st for part two of the A2L refrigerant webinar series. Thank you and have a great afternoon.